must make whole men whole men. It is my belief that culture and the correct view of one's history and heritage is the fundamental basis for such wholeness. I would like to introduce a few people to you before we get started. We have some very staunch supporters of our programs in the audience. One is our is the president of the Compton Community Board of Trustees, Mr. Carl Robinson. <laughs> also, our Associated Student Body President, Mrs. Ke Kelly Hamilton Wilson. <laughs> and I would also like to introduce to you the EOPNS staff who has worked diligently in bringing this program to you, and they're standing on the side and probably around this room. Our moderator tonight is someone that I feel very close to. He has worked and done numerous research articles as he was employed at Compton Community College as our historical researcher. He's a very brilliant young brother who has read thousands of books. He has written numerous papers and has also authored his own book. I would like to bring to you our moderator for this weekend symposium, Mr. Renoko Rashidi. Uh, good evening. Initially, I was supposed to be a bit more than uh, the moderator for this evening. I was supposed to speak on the African origin of Greco-Roman civilization. We've had a slight change, however. Um, our first speaker tomorrow, or actually our second speaker, Mr. Legrand Clegg, has suffered a, a death in his immediate family. And uh, unfortunately, as a result of that, um, my presentation is going to be delayed until tomorrow morning, or early tomorrow afternoon. I hope you'll be able to come out, because tomorrow's program, while there's no Ivan Van Sertimus on the, <laughs> on the scorecard, is really going to be impressive and deal with some areas that most of us are really not very familiar with. For example, the Black Madonnas of Europe. Now, UCLA, as you probably know, had a program last week and called the Dark Madonna. And by the time I left, you know, I began to wonder, well, is there such a thing as a Black Madonna? They right. said that the blackness didn't have anything to do with the ethnic makeup. It didn't have anything to do with the culture. But tomorrow, we're going to have a presentation that will show just the opposite of that, and we'll trace the Madonna figures in Europe back to Isis and Horus in North Africa. I think most of us are aware that that's where that starts. We will feature Brother Don Luke, who is a young brother also, but has done some very exciting research on blacks in Western Europe. It will feature someone else you're probably not familiar with, an elder named Mr. William Preston. Come out and check him out tomorrow. He's bad. Older brother, likes to call himself a, well, I don't like the one, he, he likes to call himself a field nigger sense that his goal, as he sees it, is to utilize this information to break the master's control, not to intellectually go off, and not to just get excited and fascinated by it, but to use this as a method or a means of liberation, because that's really what it's all about. It's not just an intellectual exercise, although it's exciting, you know, it's very thrilling, but this is vital to our survival as a people, and not just our survival, but to our enhancement as a people and the rebuilding of a strong African society, strong African people all over the world. Also the program tomorrow will feature Dr. Richard King, who will deal with the ice ages in Europe and the effect that that had on a transformation of human types from black to white. I should point out also that while Legrand is not going to be here, his paper will be read by Mr. Nono Olu. So we will have that information also. An added plus tomorrow will be Mr. James Brunson, now, you people, who's James Brunson? It's probably the question that goes through a lot of your minds. James Brunson is a young art historian in DeKalb, Illinois. And if any of you came out and saw Alexander von Wootenau a couple of years ago, and you saw these slides, they really opened up your eyes in terms of blacks in early America. Well, Brunson has a similar collection of slides in terms of blacks in Europe and Asia. And he's a young man that you'll be reading about more and more and more as the years progress. But tonight, we have somebody who's very special, and you all know him. He's Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. And I've known Ivan for several years now, and we've had working relationships off and on. He's been to Compton College several times, and I've always admired his work. But recently, that has really grown in stature. Now, the most recent issue of the journal, The African Presence in Asia, I edited in actuality. 
And I got a chance to see firsthand what it takes to put one of these books out. And I said, man, is, you know, my little hair that's left on there was falling out. It was turning gray. I was talking in my sleep. You know what I'm saying? Ivan has been doing this since 1979, year in and year out. It's so easy to say, I'm through with it, to hell with that. I don't want to hang anymore. But some people have that ability to remain constant and in spite of fair weather or foul to maintain the course. And Van Sertema has done that as well as anybody I know. Not only that, but the journals have had a, a quality of excellence about them. They just haven't been a, a, a bunch of pictures and a few paragraphs thrown together. But they've always had a fundamental theme, and they've always hit the nail right on the head. And they've always had articles in it that were supported by solid scholarship. And so let me read a little bit about Ivan in a method of introducing him. He was born in Guyana, South America. He was educated at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London University and the Rutgers Graduate School and holds degrees in African Studies, Linguistics, and Anthropology. He's a literary critic, a linguist, and an anthropologist. He has made a name for himself in all three fields. As a literary critic, he's the author of Caribbean Writers, a collection of critical essays in the Caribbean novel. He's also the author of several major literary reviews published in Denmark, in India, in Britain, and the United States. He was honored, honored for his work in this field by being asked by the Nobel Committee of the Swedish Academy to nominate candidates for the Nobel Prize in Literature from 1976 to 1980. And as a linguist, he has published essays on the dialect of the Sea Islands of the Georgia coast. He is also the compiler of the Swahili Dictionary of Legal Terms. Now, many of you probably say, I didn't know anything like that existed, based on, the, on his field work in Tanzania in East Africa, 1967. He's the author, as you probably know, of They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in Ancient America, the most comprehensive and thorough book of its type currently available. It was published by Random House in 1977, and it's currently in its 10th printing. It was published in French in 1981, and in the same year was awarded the Clarence L. Hope Prize, a prize awarded every two years for work of excellence in literature and the humanities relating to the cultural heritage in the African diaspora. Professor Van Sertema is the associate professor, or is an associate professor, of African studies at Rutgers University in New Jersey, and editor of the Journal of African Civilization. I could say a lot more, but I'm just going to introduce him, and instead of introducing him as Ivan Van Sertema, I'm going to introduce him as Ivan the Great, because that's what I think he is. I want to begin my lecture tonight by expressing my great gratitude to Renoko Rashidi, Lee Grand Clegg II, James Bronson, Don Luke, and all the others who have made major contributions to the journal. One of the things that became very obvious to me when I completed They Came Before Columbus was the fact that one was very much alone. This is how I felt for many years. I knew very little about the work that was happening around me. I knew about Chancellor Williams, yes, I knew about Diop. I knew also about Rogers, but there were very few people that I felt were involved in what I was involved in. Many of the articles I had read, many things I had seen around me were not involved in any serious, in-depth study of African contributions. It was merely enough to make a mention, something that was tantalizing, something that was provocative, but very seldom proven with a heavy body of authority. What I am extremely pleased about is that there has arisen since 1977, the publication of my book, a whole school of scholars. Men like Rashidi, who is the first person who has edited um, one of the journals, the last issue, African Presence in Early Asia, and I'm extremely grateful for that because Asia is one area in which I have done very little research, and without Rashidi's assistance, that journal would have been impossible. It is very important to know this, that we are involved not in any individual thrust. We are involved in a collective crusade. This is a crusade that involves us all. There is a spirit alive in the world. One sees it as one goes out of this country. I saw it in England. I remember many years ago 
about eight years ago when I visited England and I saw my younger brother and I took to him a copy of They Came Before Columbus. I had just completed it and I gave it to him as a Christmas present and he was very annoyed. He took it and threw it across the room. This was a man I had not seen for 10 years. And he said, you spent 10 years studying African? I know they hunt lions, they're rather brave, but what else? That is the colonization of the imagination to which we were subject. Suddenly I was brought back over 10 years. I had not realized the vast distance I had traveled in my head. I had come back to another planet of the mind. To hear my brother speak, I knew because I was educated like him, I was trained like him. In fact, I had gone further in the betrayal of the black race than anyone I know because I was as anti myself as anything could be. I mean, when it comes to the colonization of the imagination, I was the perfect model. I was the perfect blueprint of the British. There was a phase of rebellion which was extreme. In fact, I was one of the people who was mentioned in a white paper in the British Parliament as being viciously anti-white, anti-British. Years afterwards, I wondered if it was the same person. I had become so tamed by the misfortune of that period that I had promised never to open my mouth again against the empire. It is quite clear that I did not keep that promise. <laughs> However, when I went back to England in January of this year with, and Sheikh Anta Diop appeared on the same platform with me, that was a new England. There was my brother sitting in the audience listening to me for the very first time with tears in his eyes. He could not recognize the man who was his own family. And there underwent a conversion. And this is the sort of thing that I'm talking about, conversion that we are involved in a crusade that is as serious as the crusade of Christ or the crusade of Muhammad. A crusade that alters consciousness. A crusade that is almost religious in terms of its intensity and in terms of its impact and effect. One can actually change the mind of the world. Only history can do that. We cannot do that by being overwhelmed constantly by the living present. Because the present is only a fragment of reality. It is truly said that reality, appearance is seldom reality, and reality seldom appears. And the reason why reality seldom appears is that you have to make reality. Reality is the evocation of a wholeness. A wholeness must contain the past aspects of the living present and have shadows stretching out towards the future. This is what we are trying to do. And you can only do it by reconnecting the past to the living present. The prejudices which we suffer today, the colonization of the imagination, the kind of blindness that exists in Western civilization is due to profound errors and often profound misrepresentations, deliberate conspiracies against the history of the African and the history of other peoples in the third world. What we are learning at this conference is tremendously important because we become aware through the work of these various scholars involved in this, what lay at the very root of European civilization. I'll never forget Gandhi's statement when he was asked, what do you think of European civilization? And Gandhi said, it would have been a good idea. <laughs> because truly, there was no proper civilization in Europe. The Greeks had nothing that we could boast about until they met the Africans in Egypt. And this is not speculation. The Greeks say so themselves. In the new book that comes out in December, African Presence in Early Europe, which is the most comprehensive volume in the world on this subject. It is larger even than Blacks in Science. It's the most ambitious project attempted by the Journal of African Civilizations. We have an essay by Martin Bernal, who is a classicist scholar. He, in fact, was related in some way to some of the early works of Gerald Massey, etc., through the family. And Martin Bernal shows that initially there was an ancient model which the Greeks built up, showing quite clearly, not only through Herodotus, but through Euripides and Aeschylus, that they were very well aware that most of their gods 
that many of their sciences, their philosophic, philosophic concepts depended upon the African. They make this quite clear in statement after statement, and they have no doubt as to who the early Egyptians were. They actually saw them. They weren't speculating about them, and they said they had woolly hair and black skin. I'll never forget Sheikh Anti Diop bringing that up at the Cairo conference in 1974, and a modern Egyptian who has nothing to do with the pyramids jumping up, Abdullah was his name, <laughs> jumping up and saying, even if they're black skin, they're white. <laughs> I saw echoes of that just a month ago. I was on the radio in New Orleans, and um, a white professor called up and says, I cannot understand how you could say such a thing about the early Egyptians being black. Everyone knows that they were Caucasoid Hamites. And I said, but why then did the Greeks say they had black skin and woolly hair? He said, yes, because they're Hamites. They were burnt by the sun. I said, my dear good fellow, this is not a minstrel show. <laughs> you cannot put on black skin and woolly hair when you want to claim a civilization, and then when you don't want to claim it, when you want to push us out, you say it's pure lily white. How come you put on your black skin in order to become lily white whenever you try to interfere with our civilization? <laughs> He was not aware, and this is, a, this is a professor who should know something about Egypt. He, he spoke so eloquently about Egypt. He was not aware about that, of Tarsetti. Few of you are aware of how important some of the articles in the journal are, how original many of them are, how original in their view, how original in their whole thrust. There are gentlemen who come to our lectures sometimes. For example, I was speaking on Saturday to a completely white audience, our professors and others um, belonging to the Early Sites Research Society. And I was talking to them about Egypt because they, they know a lot about Egypt, but they think the Egyptians are white. And they were quite shocked to hear about Tasseti. They were quite shocked to hear of Diop. They'd never heard the name Diop before. They knew nothing about the melanin dosage test. They knew nothing about the, the, the test done in the mummies in the Marietta excavations. They knew nothing about the cells had black blood. They all thought that making their noise about the cells, they were talking about white people. They didn't know that when the Romans invaded Britain, they saw lots of black people around them. They knew nothing about the origin of any of these things. They knew nothing about if a black king in Ireland or a black Viking, the black has been completely wiped out of history. And whenever he becomes difficult to wipe out, you have to give him a title. Like, for example, when they found a black mummy, just a few years ago, they found a black mummy preceding any of the other Egyptian mummies, and they said he was a dancer. <laughs> he couldn't be a king since he was black, therefore he had to be a dancer. Why did they choose a dancer? Most of you can immediately jump to conclusions why he had to be a dancer. And there's a marvelous picture in the Times in London. Here is the black dancing, and here are these white in Bo Derek hairstyles surrounding the black, and they are sitting on the thrones. And the question arises, why weren't they mummified? Why is the only the dancer mummified? Were they trying to freeze his rhythm? <laughs> These absurdities do not appear as absurdities because you have a blindness in the eye of the world. As I have pointed out again and again, the reason why I was able to do the Swahili Dictionary of Legal Terms is not because I was a legal expert or a linguistic expert, but I found to my astonishment, and it was very fortunate that I got into university very late. There was no university in my country, therefore you couldn't go to university. You had to come first for the whole country. By the age of 16, I finished all the exams I could take in my country, so I had to take the exam again and again and again. Three years I kept taking the same exam to try and come first. Because only if you came first could go to the university. I couldn't come first because only people taking math and the precise sciences could get 80, 90. People taking literature, economics, history could only get into the 70s in the British world. So eventually it took me 10 years before I broke into the university and I am very happy about that 
because I had a chance slowly to educate myself. So that when I reached in the university and the got, got to be systematically miseducated, parts of it couldn't go inside very far. It that kept falling out. Even though I was trying to integrate it, the first hammer blow that struck me, it all fell away. Because one began to look with a different eye at the world, even though I completely believed in the English, I began to look at them very carefully, very analytically, wondering if my world had gone mad. And when I went into Africa, I was certain that my world had gone mad. Either I had gone mad or they had gone mad. Because I saw them sitting around trying to create legal terms in Swahili out of English concepts. And when I said, why don't you go among the people and find out what they're doing in the field of the law, I got the most sarcastic answer from an Englishman. Van Sertima, you rather green, aren't you? He go among the people to look at their books to see how they use these terms. What books? These people only started to write when we came here. <laughs> this contempt runs through all African studies. What we are doing here today is considered to be a romantic enterprise. Studies of primitives, studies of peripheral Africans, study of little communities scratching the soil, that's considered to be serious anthropology. But studies of great civilizations, complex development, contributions to world civilization, that's considered to be romantic. <coughs> when it is done in Europe, it is not romantic. Nobody studies the peripheral Europeans. The Wall Street Journal, I found to my astonishment a few months ago using my same thesis, core and periphery, where they are pointing out, this is the Wall Street Journal, you know, using the exact words that I have been using for years, saying that when you move away from the core of European civilization to the periphery, you find people on the edge of starvation. I have lived among those people. I know them. I know that on the edge of Europe, you have people on a semi-primitive level, because I have lived among Europeans who have never seen a black man in all history. And some of them, as many as 20 to 30 Europeans using one bathroom. This is the 20th century. In 1917, as late as the beginnings of this century, the Russians only had the, the hoe. That was the highest level of technology among a great, in a great part of Russia. In 1945, when the Russians advanced down against the Germans, some of them in Budapest saw a watch for the first time ticking. They ran away. They thought it was a time bomb. <laughs> this is the middle of the 20th century. We do not treat Europe in that way. We do not deal with European history in that way. We do not look at the primitives or the barbarians on the edge of Europe. We always search for the best, the quintessential European, the Greeks and the Romans, and even they, when we start to scratch the surface, there's a black man underneath it. Because there is absolutely no question that the so-called Greek miracle would not have been possible without the contributions of the Egyptians. And there is no question among the Greeks that those Egyptians they met and found were black Africans. The whole world has changed. America, for example, is no longer America. There's almost no American in this room. We're all Europeans, Africans, Asians, etc. There may be one or two American Indians, or there may be one or two of us who have a streak of American Indian blood. So the original Americans are not the Mer modern Americans. The original Egyptians are not the modern Egyptians. Sadat, when he was here a few years ago, said on CBS television, it was struck off the air. I am a black man, and I'm the first true pharaoh in 2,000 years. <laughs> that was struck off the air. He repeated it to Jesse Jackson, though. And I don't think his wife would like that statement. I heard that she was annoyed when she heard a black man play to that in the TV series. <laughs> Egyptians have some strange, modern Egyptians, they have some strange ideas about their heritage. And yet, when you, they start, to, you start talking about the achievements of Egypt, they're jumping to claim it. They have absolutely nothing to do with that. <laughs> their line breaks long before their line starts 
long after that classical Egyptian. And the same thing that happened to the Americans and Egyptians happened to the Moors. When you talk about the Moors today, you're not talking about the Moors that went into Europe. You're talking about a mishmash of people with a whole complex of blood in the place they call Mauritania. Do not confuse the modern Moor with the ancient Moor. Some of them still are black. Do not confuse the modern Egyptian with the ancient Egyptian, though some of them are still black. Do not confuse the modern American with the ancient American, so some of them are still true Americans. This is why the historical thing becomes so problematic, because we have to constantly realize what we are talking about. The word is first used, it seems, by the Greeks. Moros means dark or black. And when the Romans invade West Africa in 46 BC, they speak of the West Africans as Mores, black people from the Greek Moros, dark black. There are other um, <coughs> origins of the word Mero leading to Mo, etc., so that you have sometimes the Ethiopian thing, the word for Ethiopians, which is Ethiops, Greek also, burnt skin, the word for more, and at some time, Ethiop and Moore being interchangeable for all black Africans. When Shakespeare speaks of the Moor, he thinks of him as a black African. Whether it is Othello or whether it is the figure in Titus Andronicus, he has accepted that the word Moor is the term for black African. You find in many cases in Europe where that word appears linked to, an, to a European name, you can go right back and find black ancestry down that European line. So the word is used originally to deal with black people. However, it becomes more confused as we go on. But the original Moors, the ancestor of the Moors, are the Garamantes. There we see them in the Sahara at first, and we see evidence of their civilization. We see their horse-drawn chariots. We see rock engravings of them since 5000 BC. We see javelin, armed men, etc. But as history progresses, they become far more complex people. They're not just involved in farming, etc. They also become involved in far more complex tasks until they become an almost invincible people, and they're mentioned by the Romans, etc. There are also another set of people who became mixed up with the Moors. The Libyans in the north of Egypt. Now, this is a very confusing thing, too, because some people speak of those early Libyans as Negroid, and there may have been some black Libyans, but we also have white Libyans in the north of Egypt. They are called Tamahu by the Egyptians. Tama means people. Hu means white or light ivory, of light ivory skin. And we find them defeated by the blacks in the first dynasty. Menes you makes a raid against these fair-skinned people, and they are defeated and crushed by the blacks and then they are kept in control. We also have later evidence of thrusts against them by the blacks on the Sethos in the 18th dynasty, also raids by the Sudanese, etc. But these Libyans, some of the, the fair skin types, go back into parts of northern Africa, into mix with blacks, and we have a, a mix of these people so that we both have black moors, which are the Garamante type, and we also have tawny or white moors, which include the mixed type and the fair skin type. However, at the time of the invasion, we're going to find a different situation again emerging. But let me, before I deal with the invasion of Europe by the moors, bring into context the most important figure behind that invasion, and that is Muhammad himself. Muhammad is born in 571 AD. He is born among a very backward people, just as Jesus was born among um, fairly backward people. I want to note something that people speak of Christ as a Jew. Jesus, not Christ, Jesus, the Christ, okay, because there are Christ before Jesus. Okay, the idea of the Christ comes from the African word Christ, Christ, Egyptian meaning the anointed one. So you have Christ figures before you have Jesus. He is Jesus the Christ, the last and the most powerful and most remarkable of the Christ figures. But Muhammad 
When Muhammad is born, Muhammad is born among warring Arab tribes, tribes of the desert. Muhammad transcends the limitations, the blindnesses, the stupidities, the savagery of those warring tribes and brings to birth a religion, an idea, a concept, a vision of man that is unusual and has tremendous appeal and that starts a whole new crusade and movement. What is it that attracted people to Islam? What is it that attracted people to Muhammad's vision? And that is the fact, first of all, Muhammad accepted Jesus and Moses. So Christians did not feel, or people who believed in Jesus did not feel that they had to abandon Jesus, okay? Because the Muslims embraced Jesus, they embraced Moses, they accept them as prophets also. They also have doctrines of equality and brotherhood. They also encouraged commerce, which attracted the town dwellers, and they encouraged the idea of conquest, that they would go out in a great crusade to conquer the world. This is something that inspired the, the restless desert tribe. So there was something for everybody. And another thing which is very important, that they did not, like the later Christians, so-called Christians, um, they did not attempt to destroy the cultures of other people in order to make them um, Muslim because you could confess to being a Muslim and become a Muslim and still retain aspects of your culture. This is something that we find very startling at a place like Walata, later on in medieval Mali, where the Arabs are startled like Ibn Battuta to find that the Africans are continuing all of their main customs and yet they're calling themselves Muslims. So that they give full obeisance to Allah and they have all the elements that you would find in Islam but they are also maintaining their own culture, they don't destroy it. This is going to become a very important point as we continue because you're going to see why is it that the Africans and the Arabs invading Europe, Europe did not destroy European culture and yet brought something superior to it into Europe yet did not destroy it. Whereas Europeans invading Africa and other places sought to destroy everything they found. The great thrust into other parts of the world begins with the death of Muhammad. These men in their lifetime had a very difficult passage. Jesus as you know was not very much liked by the Jews. Muhammad was not very much liked by the Arabs. You may well ask, how could they become kings of the Jews and the Arabs and they're not particularly liked by them? That is the nature of things. Because Jesus, we must bear in mind, Jesus was started to preach things which antagonized the Jewish high priest. Jesus was, in, was mad enough to take up a whip and run into the temple and chase the Jews out of it. They never forgave him for that. And Jesus would had, had the cheek, the effrontery to tell them, Moses say an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth, but I say. As though he could put himself again, over and above Moses. The same thing was true of Muhammad. Muhammad made statements that eventually led him to be run out of his country. Most of you know of the flight, in fact, the beginning of the year for the Muslims begin with this flight. The flight is in 622. It's known as the Hegira. And this is one of the significant things in the life of Muhammad and in the beginnings of Mohammedanism. As you know, when Jesus was born, he had to be smuggled into Africa. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he was smuggled into Africa. He lived in the village of Marathia on the edge of Heliopolis. And there he remained, we know, for at least 12 years because the first time we hear of Jesus after his birth is when he's sitting with the Egyptian doctors talking. And then we do not know what happens to him for a long time, though there are theories about this. Some Jews say that he was an Essene, which means he was trained by the Egyptians, and then he comes back, as the Bible says in Hosea, out of Egypt shall I call my son. He comes back out of Africa and he goes to begin his mission, which lasts for about three years before he is killed. I cannot, even though I'm dealing with 
the Muslim thing, I cannot leave Jesus alone at this point because there are certain things that have to be understood. And one of these is, how come Christ became white? <laughs> the only time Christ met white people was the day he was, go he was arrested when the Roman soldiers came upon him. And the next time he had dealings with white people is when they were pushing the sword up, his, up in his side. Yet here he is, blue-eyed and blonde hair, and his only encounter with Europeans are with policemen and soldiers. And it's very important to note that there is no harm nevertheless in representing God or what you conceive to be God in your own image. There's no crime in that. The Europeans had a perfect right to make Christ white because once they were converted to Christ, fine. But don't go pushing it down other people's throats. That is the point. Don't come telling me about the white Christ because the first physical representation of Christ is found in a coin of Justinian II. And when you look at him, he has African hair, he has the woolly hair, and he has brown skin, he has a Semitic type nose, which you could find, for example, on the so-called, um, uh, the thing they have in the Vatican, which they wouldn't allow to be carbon dated, but the Shroud of Turin. But it is quite clear that we are dealing with a type that is mixed and which, as Edward Kennedy, to my surprise, pointed out to that bigot um, the, a few months ago that if Jesus was in South Africa, he would be called a black and he would be treated like a black. Muhammad transcends also this, the littleness of the people around him. So that these men represent, they're not to be seen in racial terms, they represent the very best in human consciousness, in human vision, the vision of the human, and they transcend race and sex. That is the reason why they became universal universal principles in the world. We are not to attack Christianity or to attack Islam because of excesses by Arabs or Jews because that has nothing to do with the essential Christ or the essential doctrine of Muhammad. We have to go back to when it was a revolutionary doctrine, when it had the pristine quality that could transform the world because men take anything and make it into anything. You have men on the slave ships writing beautiful hymns, Jesus, Jesus, you lover of my soul, and they have blacks sitting, blacks dying right under them while they're writing their beautiful hymns to Jesus. That has nothing to do with Jesus. As Marx once said, I am not a Marxist. And Jesus would have said if he saw what the Europeans were doing with Christianity, I'm not a Christian. But well, we have to distinguish the church from the religion because the church does not necessarily follow the tenet, the revolutionary tenet, the revolutionary spirit involved in religion because Jesus was a rebel. He was fighting European imperialism of the Romans as we are fighting imperialism today. He was crucified, however, not because of that opposition, because they did not take him seriously. He had not yet begun to affect, not until his death, he had not yet begun to affect that Roman. What the people who made sure that he was crucified are his own people. One, one only hopes that that is not a prophecy of what will happen to some of our leaders. Because very often it is that the vision and consciousness of people can become so limited that in their stupidity and blindness, they destroy that which can save them. After his death, trouble broke out because his father-in-law, Abu Bakir, was elected as the leader, whereas Ali, his brother-in-law, nearest in blood, some people felt should have been the successor to Muhammad. Hence, from the very beginning, Mohammedanism split into two factions. The Shiites who believed in hereditary rights and thought that the brother-in-law nearest in blood to Muhammad should succeed. And the Sunnites or Sunni Muslims who believed that it was right that Abu Bakir should be elected as being the most fit in the family to be successor to Muhammad. This 
struggle between the Sunnis and the Shiites or the Sunnites and the Shiites is going to become very important in our consideration of the Moors. However, after Muhammad's death, you have a thrust by the Muslims into various parts of the world. They move into Egypt as early as 638 AD. They conquer Egypt. They move into Tripoli in 643 AD. They, they cover southwest Morocco 681 AD. And then as they move down into Africa, they move, they make thrust into India. They make thrust even as far as China. They make thrust down into Africa. And in Africa, many people are converted to Islam. This appeals to them just as, as Christian doctrine was to appeal to a lot of people, eventually overcoming the very people who attempted to destroy the Christ. This Islam spreads rapidly in Africa. In some places it is resisted, in some places it is accepted. And eventually some Africans are made, um, as under the Muslims, some Africans become major figures um, promoting Islam. Musa bin Nasir becomes governor of North Africa in 698 AD. And he is a very ambitious man who intends to conquer as much territory as possible and who has his eyes looking across the Straits of Gibraltar towards the southern part of Europe. But he cannot advance on Europe because he has to complete his conquest of North Africa. And in North Africa there is a tremendous fortress which is almost invincible. It's known as Ceuta. And it is run, it is controlled by Count Julian. It is almost invincible. Nothing can um, defeat Julian. But Julian sends his virgin daughter over to Spain to spend some time with Roderick in the court of Roderick. Roderick is the king of Spain and he's the head of the Visigoths who have been in control for about two centuries. And while his virgin daughter is in the court of Roderick, she ceases to be a virgin as a result of Roderick's um, adventures and Julian gets very angry, switches his allegiance and offers help to the Africans and Arabs to march over the Straits. Now the Africans first send out Tarif in 710 AD. Tarif is important because he enters our language. Whenever you hear about tariffs, that comes from him. Taxes on goods coming in or goods going out, a tariff, that comes from the word tariff, an African. This is followed, he is successful in his first raid, and this is followed in 711, the very next year, by Tariq. Tariq takes with him 7,000 troops, most of them African. When I say most of them are African, you have to understand, as I was explaining, that although the ancestors of the Moors are the Garamantes, and that you, which is a, is a black type, you also have other types of Moors, like the Libyan mixture or the, or the, the so-called Berber, and you have Berbers who are blue-eyed and blonde-haired in Africa just as you have black Berbers, because you have trickling of people, nomadic types, coming out of southern Europe, crossing into Africa. Africa is very close to Europe. It's only 20 miles distance, northern Africa. So you do have some types which are not black, but the majority of them as described are black, dark skin. You have Toynbee, who is a very conservative historian. This is what he says of the first dynasty. Now there are four major dynasties in Europe that are Muslim. The first one is called the Umayyad dynasty. And Toynbee speaking of them says, the Arabs who were the ruling element of the Umayyad Caliphate called themselves the swarthy people, swarthy means dark skin, with a connotation of racial superiority and their Persian and Turkish subjects were known by them as the ruddy people with a connotation of racial inferiority. That is to say, they drew the distinction that we draw between blondes and brunettes, but they reversed the value. So that the darker you were, the more superior you were thought to be. Hence, there couldn't be white people moving into Europe. Okay, because you would, would not have the reversal of va value. Now, it is amazing how these people are described because I have read a book, for example, by Charlotte Young, I think it was, 
And all through the book, right up to page 175, the Moors are fair-skinned with blue eyes. And as soon as they start to be defeated, blacks are falling on the battlefield. Where they come from, I don't know. <laughs> As I said, it is a mystery that they are so absent in life and have such a great presence in death. <laughs> the movement, the first dynasty is known as the Umayyad dynasty. It is a Sunni dynasty and it is, they rule Spain from 715 to 750. By the way, I have to point out to you that this thrust did not only overcome Spain, it also took part of Portugal and during the years 715 to 750 AD, you have movements which continue, which take over parts of France like Lyons, Macon, Chalons, sur saone All of these places are taken over by the Moors. So you have a big chunk of Europe, what is known as the Iberian Peninsula, that are taken over by black troops. And Arab types, which are both black, as well as a few of them being fair-skinned types. The situation however does not remain um very firm much after 750 because the shiites and the sunnites are fighting this is these are muslim factions and the shiites murder the caliph or king of the umayyad dynasty in 750 he's assassinated he goes on a visit to mesopotamia and he's assassinated and the, almost the whole royal family is killed the royal family are holidaying in Damascus and 70 members of the royal family are assassinated by the Shiites. And then come the Shiite dynasty, which is known as the Abbasid dynasty, which only runs for about five to six years. It is it's ruled by Abu al-Abbas. But in Africa, and this is very important to note, that the very opposite to what happened recently in relation to Europe and Africa began to happen in relation to Africa to Europe. The Africans maintain their power in Africa and keep a colony in Europe so that when weakness occurs in Europe, they go back into Africa, strengthen themselves and thrust again into Europe. And you find this happening when a Sunni by the name of Abdul Rahman goes back into Africa, strengthens himself, collects an African army and charges back into Europe smashes the Abbasid dynasty and resurrects the Umayyad dynasty. So after a period of about five or six years, the Umayyad dynasty takes control again in Europe. Now I want to run down to you these dynasties before I tell you about the achievements of the Moors in Europe because the achievements of the Moors in Europe are something astonishing. You would be absolutely amazed now that we have a body of scholars because I'm drawing now upon the work of Wayne Chandler, Sheikh Antony Up, Chancellor Williams, John Jackson, and research that I have done myself, you would be absolutely astonished by the enormity of the contribution of the Moors. This is going to have, you will see, a profound effect on the Industrial Revolution and what is known as the European Renaissance in the arts and sciences. But it's important to understand what were the dynasties and how do we know some of them were black? Because in some cases, the racial situation is very confused. In other cases, it is very, very clear. And a lot of problems have arisen in the study of the Moors because of the fact that we have so few pictures. In previous situations where we are studying African history, our problem has been that the European has destroyed so much. We have the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. We have the destruction of Library of Timbuktu, we have the destruction of books in America, only half a dozen of which survive. We have the systematic destruction of Moorish libraries at Granada in 1492, the year Columbus sailed. But here we have something which is equally annoying. The Muslims do not believe in making portraits of themselves. They consider that a kind of idolism and therefore we have very few pictures of the moors in fact most of the pictures we have of the moors are drawn by their enemies and you, they, we do have a few slides here today which i will show you including the cover for the book african presence in all europe but as i say there are very few 
But we do know that in the Umayyad dynasty, something very unusual begins to happen. First of all, the Muslims show themselves to be extremely generous in victory. Instead of trying to destroy everything they find in Europe and plant their own stuff in, they allow the Europeans to live side by side with them. As they say, they retreated Muslim, Jew, and Christian alike. The Jews, in fact, assist the Muslims to defeat the Christians because the Christians are persecuting the Jews. So this is another factor that we find um, in the world of the Umayyad. Another thing unusual that begins to happen is that wherever races are strange to each other or are polarized, you find magnetic attractions between races. Wherever you have polarization, you have this occurring. And you find, for example, that the Jews who had already been made slaves, now their slavery is upturned. And I'm not attacking the Jews, by the way. Okay, I have to be very careful about that. <laughs> because I am not anti-Semitic. Um, recently I have been um, speaking at Farrakhan's place, the final call, and there was a big picture in the final call with me making speeches, etc. And several people have asked me, are you anti-Jewish? And I pointed out to them that my common ground with Farrakhan, as with any black leader in this country or the world, is our common commitment to black pride and black dignity. <laughs> what opinion, what opinions Farrakhan has about the Jews, that is his business. I had to point out to my university that how could I be anti-Jew when my lawyer is a Jew, my publisher is a Jew, my dentist is a Jew, my psychiatrist is a Jew, and not only are my best friends Jew, Oh, my only friends are the Jews. So let me put that to rest. Including the black Jews, of course. <laughs> the important thing to note here is that something began to happen which is very unfortunate, and that is the white slave trade. Slave comes from Slav. And the reason why the word slave comes from Slav is that the first slaves are white. The Arabs and the Jews get involved in this. It is said that Abdul Rahman had nothing to do with it. He did not give it its blessing, etc. But they seem to be have some sort of secret on the ground slave trade going on. And you find just as when the whites took over countries, they brought black women into their harems or at least had secret liaisons with black women, you have white women finding themselves into the concubinages or harems of Arabs and Africans. They had the power to do this, and you find this happening as a result of which you have mixings and meltings of people that further com complexify the situation of who were the Moors. But this does not remain for long because after we move from the Umayyad dynasty, the other two dynasties are clearly, clearly African. The Almoravi dynasty, for example, when Abdurrahman died, Someone takes over who is not as capable as a general or as an administrator, and you find tremendous upheaval, and you find that they cannot sustain and consolidate their positions in Europe. The Christians, the European Christians, begin to arm themselves against them, and eventually by 1031, the Caliph is dethroned, and the Umayyad dynasty comes to close. This goes on for a little while, but once again, Africa throws thrust again into Europe. It's not just one invasion. It's very important to note that the Africans do not lose their base in Africa and that is why the Muslim thing was kept up for so long. Because when the Muslims cracked up in Europe, the Africans were thrust again into Europe and sustained the Muslim dynasty. Thus it is that just around the time the Caliph is dethroned, we find something happening, beginning to happen in Africa, a man called Yaya, an African called Yaya, is um, developing a movement in the Sahara. He links Al Mutamed comes over to Africa and begs the Africans to help him to go and and strengthen themselves because the the Christians now are beginning to take control again 
and are persecuting the Muslims. So the African army thrust back into Europe. 15,000 men, including 6,000 cavalry. That is very important. This battle is described. The Europeans were quite shocked when they saw men. You know the Senegalese are about, the average Senegalese is about six feet six. <laughs> you see these tall black men on white Arabian steeds charging down on them across the battlefields, of, across the fields of Europe. They ran like hell. <laughs> and you have once again the reassertion of the Muslims in Europe. You have what is known as the Almoravi dynasty, which is the third major dynasty in Europe. And some of the kings of Spain, the little kings, petty kings, not running over Spain with little principalities, they are soon conquered. And the Africans, it seems, assume once more supreme control. Towards the close of the Umayyad dynasty, you have them split up into little principalities. But here now they have one central sovereign, a sultan, who takes full control from about 1086 AD, and this runs for a whole century. This century, very remarkable things happen. The Africans have their court in Africa and their court in Spain, just as the Europeans later were to have their, their consolidated, their, their um, empire consolidated at home and abroad. The Africans have their courts in Africa and their courts in Spain. And the Almoravid, they, um, are very strong until Yusuf dies and then comes his son who is not as strong, not as prepared and things begin to fall to pieces after a while and once again the after about around 1142 the African Empire is lost as well and the Spanish Empire is lost three years later but then comes another African this is the last and the most African of all the dynasties this is known as Almahari a man arises, a leader in Africa in the tw early 12th century who calls himself Mahdi or the Mahdi and his followers uh, begin to strengthen themselves and they push aside the Almoravids and they invade Europe and by 1150 their armies defeat the Christians of Spain. This is the last of the great African dynasties. It runs right through to 1230 AD when eventually the Christians con begin to push the Africans back. About three million Africans go back down into Africa and the things begin to break up in the Iberian Peninsula. And by f th this still holds, it still holds a certain strength for about 200 years until 1492, the very year Columbus sailed, the last great battle between the Christians and the Moors occurred and the Christians are finally defeated at Granada and a massive destruction of Moorish documents occur. But what did the Moors bring to Europe? Why is it that Spain and Portugal, where the Moors were strongest, why is it that they led the expansion of Europe? Why is it that the thrust into America, into Africa was led by Spain and Portugal? What special advantages did they have over the rest of Europe and to what extent did the Moors have something to do with this? And here we come to their contributions. When the Moors entered Spain on the Tariq in 711 AD, Europe was in the Dark Age. Whatever the Greeks may have done, whatever the Romans may have done, Europe had fallen into grave decline. European science was a joke compared to African and Asian science. The Europeans, for example, one of them um, was trying to show that the distance from the Earth to the Moon was the diameter of the Earth. In order to write the diameter of the Earth, he calculated or estimated the circumference and divided it by two. That was the level of science. There was no complex mathematics, no complex um, science in in, either in Spain or any part of Europe at that time. Many things that, many advances that had been made by the Greeks and Romans were lost. So that when Chandler calls his article, Light of Europe's Dark Age, this is a very true and precise statement of what was happening. Then comes the Moors. And the Moors caused a massive movement of knowledge into the places where they settled. Thus we find 
that Spain becomes the main center for the translation of all the works of antiquity. Egyptian works and all other works that are translated into Arabic, then they're translated into Spanish, then they're translated into Latin. Thus Europe becomes open and the Muslims become open to the knowledge of the world. They thrust into India, they bring back various things. How many, how many of us know that the Europeans only counted with letters? The Europeans did not have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you talk about Roman numerals, it's IX and X, and those are letters. The Greeks used letters to count with. The Romans used letters. It is the Indian, the Hindu, who had those numerals, and the Arabs brought it out of India. Many things were brought out of Egypt. Many things were brought out of various parts of the world in order to build what was later to be known as Western civilization so that we have an extraordinary situation. One of the things that is most remarkable is that the very things that were used to defeat us came from outside of Europe. Artillery, firearms are not European in origin. People like to say, oh, we defeated you because we had superior firepower. Where did they get it from? The Arabs. A manuscript in Leningrad, an Arabic manuscript, shows the first use of artillery by the Moors in a battle with the Indians. The chemical components of gunpowder are developed through the chemistry of the Moors. The Europeans do not know about gunpowder. Gunpowder had been used even earlier by the Egyptians, but it was not used in the way it was used by the Europeans later on. But the Arabs used it in that way. They did use it in artillery. And the first firing of artillery in the world is by the Moors. And the first use of gunpowder in that context. And the ships, the ships were so absolutely critical to the expansion of the European Empire. Look at those ships. Take the caravel, for example, the Portuguese caravel. The Spanish caravel comes from the Arabic carabos, which comes from the pangalos, which is used in the Indian Ocean by both Arabs and Africans. The rudders, the special rudder, the four-cornered axial rudder, come, is found in China 206 BC, but long before it is found in China and brought by the Arabs by the Moors into Europe, we find the prototype of that rudder lies with the Egyptians. The forerunner of the axial rudder is found among one of the Egyptian types of oars, which operate in that way. We also find that many of the nautical instruments, the compass, the astrolabe, are not invented in Europe. They are brought in by the Moors from other parts of the world, so that Spain, where the Moors concentrated became a center through which all of these things coalesced. That is the reason why Spain was able to make the first major thrust and Portugal, not because of any other special advantage, because when we compare what was happening in the rest of Europe, we are appalled. Let me, let me for example, read to you a passage of what was happening in one of the great centers of the Moors in Europe. In Cordova, the old pack Cordova, they found a city of 250,000 houses and 1 million people when no city in Europe outside Moorish Spain had a population of 30,000. Its massive walls had a circuit of 14 miles and had seven large iron gates faced with brass. Its streets were paved so soundly indeed that in some of them you tread the same stones today, just as you cross the Guadalquivir on the same noble bridge, drained by large sewers, flushed with water from the many fountains which sparkled in the sun and lit by lamps at night. It had 80,455 shops besides 4,300 markets, and in these you could buy amber from the Baltic, Russian furs, Chinese tea, Indian spices, African ebony and ivory, and such native products in leather, metal, silk, glass, and pottery as could not be found elsewhere. It had 900 public baths. We are told that a poor Arab would go without bread rather than soap. And more than 1,000 mosques, 
the largest of which is still one of the agri ar architectural wonders of the world in spite of latest Spanish disfigurement. Its low scarlet and gold roof supported by 1,000 columns of marble, jasper, and porphyry was lit by thousands of brass and silver lamps which burned perfumed oil, the largest being 38 feet in circumference containing four to 6,000 silver plates for reflecting the light. The exquisite prayer chamber, the unique pulpit, and the Cali's private section with floors of silver and gold-plated doors completed this wonderful monument of opulence and art. Some five miles along the broad road which led to it from the city, they would enter the most wonderful garden or park in the world. Engineers who had a skill that was unequaled until the 20th century so directed its water supply, note this, so directed its water supply that there were lakes, cascades, and superb fountains on every side, while every flower and shrub that would grow in Andalusia had been brought from the ends of the earth. This is what made possible the so-called European Renaissance. When we look at the arts and sciences, and that is something that is most remarkable, paper was introduced by the Moors into Spain. The windmill was introduced into Europe by the Moors. Gunpowder was introduced into Europe by the Moors. Artillery was introduced into Europe by the Moors. The nautical instruments like the astrolabe and the compass, the, the three-cornered or four-cornered axial rudder, the three-masted ships, all these were introduced by the Moors. Here we have claiming about all of this tremendous industrial revolution that came purely out of European genius. John Papademus, the Greek physicist at the Atlanta conference last year, pointed out to us that Newton, Isaac Newton, the greatest of European scientists, pointed to several things he got from the Africans, the heliocentric theory of the universe, the idea that the earth revolves and other planets revolve around the sun. When Newton said that, they thought he was a heretic. The Africans knew that long ago. He said that first atomic theory, and I'm talking about atomic fission now, the first atomic theory developed among the Africans. Newton said that. Several things he pointed to, and I discovered to my astonishment, a friend from somewhere, I don't know which part of America, sent me an article recently showing me that Newton was an Egyptologist. And that what Papademus was saying, that Newton had got through to this knowledge through Copernicus and Galileo and so forth, now we find that Newton didn't need second hand. He actually was studying the Egyptian manuscripts. While in the 10th and 11th centuries, all Europe could show scarcely a single public library, note this, and could boast of only two universities that were worthy of the name. There were in Spain at that same time under the Moors more than 70 public libraries, of which the one in Cordova alone contained 600,000 manuscripts. In addition, the country possessed 17 famous universities, among which those at Cordova, Seville, Granada, Malaga, Jaén, Valencia, Almeria, and Toledo were especially outstanding. Astronomy, physics, chemistry, mathematics, geometry, philology, geography reached in Spain the highest stage at the time known anywhere. Artists and scholars united in special associations for the pursuit of their studies. There were regular congresses of all branches of science where the la latest achievements of research were announced and discussed, which naturally contributed greatly to the spread of scientific thought. Another most amazing thing was that the, the Moors were the first to introduce air conditioning. They heated the houses in the winter, and they did an unusual thing which we do not even do now. When they brought cool air into the house, it wasn't just cool, it was perfumed. They ran it over banks of flowers, noted for their perfume. Art, literature, and science prospered as they then prospered nowhere else in Europe. Students flocked from France and Germany and England to drink from the fountain of learning, which flowed only in the cities of the Moors. The surgeons and doctors were in the ban of science. Women were encouraged to devote themselves to serious study, and the lady doctor was not unknown among the people of Cordova. Mathematics, astronomy, and botany History, philosophy, and jurisprudence were to be mastered in Spain and Spain alone. The practical work of the field, the scientific methods of irrigation, the arts of fortification and shipbuilding, the highest and most elaborate products of the loom, the graver, and the hammer, the potter's wheel, and the mason's trowel were brought to perfection by the Spanish Moors. And when 
we come to the end, and this is something that I really have to read, when we come to the very end, because it's said in words that one cannot equal in speech the death that occurs in Spain, the death of greatness after the Moors are banished. In 1492, the last bulwark of the Moors gave way before the crusade of Ferdinand and Isabella, and with Granada fell all of Spain's greatness. For a brief while, indeed, the reflection of the Moorish splendor cast a borrowed light on the history of the land which is at once warmed with its sunny radiance. The great epoch of Isabella, Charles V and Philip II, of Columbus, Cortez and Pizarro shed a last hollow about the dying monument, the dying moments of a mighty state. Then followed the abomination of desolation, the rule of the stupid inquisition and the blackness of darkness in which Spain has been plunged ever since. In the land where science was once supreme, the Spanish doctors became noted for nothing but their ignorance and incapacity. And the discoveries of Newton and Harvey were condemned as pernicious to the faith. Where once 70 public libraries had fed the minds of scholars and half a million books had been gathered at Cordova for the benefit of the world. Such indifference to learning afterwards prevailed that the new capital, Madrid, possessed not a single public library in the 18th century. Note that. The Moors left, they were kicked out at the end of the 15th century, having left 70 libraries. And when the Africans and Arabs were forced to return back into Africa by the 18th century, they didn't have one public library. The 16,000 looms of Seville soon dwindled to a fifth of their ancient number. The arts and industries of Toledo and Almeria faded into insignificance. The very bath Public buildings of equal ornament and use were destroyed because cleanliness savored too strongly of rank and fidelity. Note that. Do you know it was a sin to smile, to show any kind of sensuality, laughter, in the, in, during the Inquisition in, in some of the courts? The land deprived of the skillful irrigation of the moors grew impoverished and neglected. The richest and most fertile valleys languished and were deserted. Most of the populous cities which had filled every district of Andalusia fell into ruinous decay, and beggars, friars, and bandits took the place of scholars, merchants, and knights. So low fell Spain when she had driven away the blacks. Such is the melancholy contrast offered by her history. And this is by Stanley Lane Poole, by the way. So that we have here a range of things. We find the corrective eyeglasses first begin among the Moors. We find a whole range of sciences and a great number of scientists, too many to mention. One of the things I have done is to reprint an essay, Cairo Science Academy of the Middle Ages, by Lumpkin and Zittler, which shows you what was pouring out of Cairo and pouring out of parts of Africa and out of Asia into Europe as a result of this. And people often ask the question, well, why is it that the Industrial Revolution did not occur in Africa? I was speaking at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology a week or so ago to graduate students there and explaining to them the tremendous advances in science that occurred in Africa, the steel smelting, the astronomical observatories, the tremendous advances in medicine, Africans using aspirin, tetracycline, antiseptics, etc., before us developing vaccines. And the question arose, why, since Africa had all of these things, why there wasn't an industrial revolution? Let me attempt to answer that question. Africa was extremely unfortunate in this respect, that it was not unusual that it should build its civilization in Europe because the Greeks built their civilization in Africa. The British built their civilization abroad. They didn't build it in Britain, although Britain was eventually to profit from this. But the remarkable thing that happened in Africa is that Africa was attacked and weakened during a decline. It was attacked, rather, and invaded during its decline, the decline of one of its centralized empires. Everyone knows that in the movement of civilization, there are periods of weakness. America had such a period of weakness at the height of the Aztec Empire, when the Aztecs had become extremely powerful and arrogant, had many dissident tribes. Cortes, with his ragged army of Spaniards, were able to walk through the Aztecs because of the fact 
that as he marched forward, since he was not immediately attacked, that is the mistake that was made by Montezuma, king of the Aztecs. Montezuma could not have avoided that mistake because in the prophecy of the Aztecs, some sort of savior was supposed to arrive in 1519, a Quetzalcoatl was supposed to return. Stupid myth, but nevertheless, it had profound consequences. Because instead of attacking Cortez, when the Americans attacked Columbus's garrison, they wiped it out in one day. Columbus left the garrison after the first voyage. The Indians wiped it out in one day. The Aztecs could easily have destroyed all the Spaniards in one hour. But they allowed Cortes to advance unsure of his intentions, and by the time they were sure of his intentions, it was too late, because as Cortes advanced, he brought the dissident tribes along with him who wanted to get back at the Aztecs. Even as the Africans advanced into Europe on the Hannibal, Europeans joined with the Africans against their own Europeans because they wanted to get back at the Romans. And this is exactly what happened here. It's unfortunate, but you have a breakup after the breakup of the Songhai Empire before Africa could catch its breath and build again as it had built after Ghana, as it had built after Mali, build again a centralized empire that could have had the integrity to resist outside invasion at least for a time and to build something in its place, Africa is broken up and fragmented so that we have both internal and external reasons for this. The situation in Europe is that Europe profited not only from the Greek invasion of Egypt, it profited most from the Moorish invasion because the African was unlike the European. He did not seek to destroy what he found. He gave without destroying what he found. The European did not give us that mercy. He tried to destroy the root of everything he found. It was not enough to introduce his kind of thing. He wanted to wipe out everything we had in our head. That is the reason why, even though slavery is over, we are still his slaves. He has tried to colonize this universe. He has tried to establish dominion over our thoughts, over our consciousness so completely that we do not even accept our own history when it's presented to us again. It seems like such a bizarre, strange, astonishing thing. I remember in January when I was in England, I was coming out, there was a vast audience. I was quite astonished. You would think we were at, it was one of the Beatles shows. And I was very startled by this because the last time I had been to England, nobody wanted to listen to this stuff. Now they're listening because they're on the edge of a grave crisis. And I was coming outside and I met a strange man and he said to me, I am your family. This is exactly how we talk. I am your family and I'm ashamed of you. I'm a distant relative of yours and I'm ashamed of you. You're fooling the black people. You know as well as I do that black people didn't do anything. <laughs> He's about 60, 65, etc. Deep, deep sickness. <laughs> Which is very different from what I found when I was in Port of Spain. I was speaking to a vast audience stretched out into the streets. And when I was finished speaking, a black man came up to me, an old man, and started to pong his head on the table. I was very frightened because I thought his head would open up. <laughs> and he said to me, he started to cry, and he said, I am so grateful. I am so grateful. This is the first day that I am proud to be a black man. This is in a picture. So we begin to realize that this reconstruction is absolutely vital to us. African history cannot be reconstructed like European history. Europe does not need this kind of intense, precise sort of research. That is why in Cairo, when the Europeans arrived, even the, the, the people who brought the Cairo conference together, they said only two people arrived prepared, the Africans. Shake Antidi up and Theophilo Benga. The Europeans brought no, nothing. They expected to walk through like before. They expected everybody to repeat their cliches and accept it. Shake Antidi up brought a truck full of books. <laughs> and they couldn't get through anymore. 
because we have put a stop to that. A line is being drawn. A whole body of scholars are emerging now, a whole school, because this is the new crusade. We don't need firearms because they're going to take the guns and turn it on themselves. What we need is the firepower of intellect. What we need is the ammunition of our history, the facts. We need the facts. We need to go back in our history and find once again the ground out of which we have come. We need to find these things so that we could set this whole place on fire. We could undermine the foundations of this civilization because this civilization is founded on a lie. The strength the strength of blackness, the strength of the black man and woman lies in the morality of the truth. It is not necessary for us to exaggerate. It is not necessary for us to invent. It is not necessary for us to create new myths because the truth itself is more astonishing than any myth that we can create. The more we learn of that history, the more we become aware of the extraordinary richness that lies behind us. We belong to something that is quite extraordinary. We are no longer simply to be linked with slaves. We are no longer simply to be linked with the peripheral African. True, Kunte Kinte is one of my ancestors, so is Chicken George. But I am more than Chicken George. So roots is just a faint it's just a faint strand in the wind, a faint thread. There are far more serious roots than that. Our roots do not lie in slavery. It lies in chapters and phases of history that go back to the very beginning of man. Because when we go into Europe, there is not a single Cro-Magnon, not a single Caucasoid until about 50,000 years ago. <coughs> that is why when I was in Wales, Many years ago, I was with African poets, Wole Shiyinka, etc. And we were at this conference of Commonwealth Poets, Commonwealth Poets Festival. And every time these people get up, they talk about the younger members of the Commonwealth. And I got up and said, what do you mean by younger? In what sense are we younger than you? We are the elders of the world. How come we are the younger? If they were not so young, they would not have been so bloody insecure as to try to force down that civilization down our throats. If they were not so young, they would have had the generosity and the humanity to allow us to exist as people in our own right. Whatever the nature of their culture, whatever their conquest, whatever the, the nature of their domination, they could have allowed us to be human but they wanted to cut everything out. They wanted to deny us our humanity, our history, our right to a separate consciousness, our right to a heritage, our right to a past, so that even today, everything we learn makes us realize that we're constantly having to move away veils in order to arrive at the truth of the past. It is covered with so many lies, it isn't funny. And as soon as you unveil one lie and you show them the truth, they find another excuse. Everything that we unveil, there is some explanation. Like when I found the stone head, well, I didn't find them, but when I made it obvious that those stone heads were African, we find an expert saying the reason why they have broad noses and thick lips is because the tools were blunt. <laughs> Every frivolous excuse is used by the establishment in order to establish in order to maintain, in order to consolidate the basic untruths that lie at the foundation of this civilization. We cannot stay silent. There's a different kind of revolution, a revolution that is more serious than rebellion. Rebellion is, a, is an act in which someone rebels against a leader or rebels against a system in such a way that even though they may triumph they remain within the system because their consciousness is ruled by that system. Revolution is more serious. Revolution is not just the victory, the rebellion, and the possible victory over the, the enemy. Revolution involves thinking very differently from the enemy. 
so that when the defeat occurs, the defeat can even occur within the enemy. When the Jews, give them their Jew, when the Christian thing through the Jews and others, when that Christian spirit began to undermine the Romans, all the value systems of the Romans were overturned. It wasn't just a question of a rebellion. Christ brought a revolution in consciousness. He made the little man important. When the Romans said to be great is to be rich, to be wealthy, to be powerful, Christ said, look at me, I'm not rich, I'm barefooted. I am not wealthy, I just have my shirt on my back. I am not powerful, I call myself king of the Jews, but my kingdom is somewhere else. This is where my kingdom is, this is my universe, okay? That is what overturned. This is what, that is why when the Romans sat in that amphitheater, they saw, they thought they were all so arrogant, they could laugh at the Christians. But when they saw the Christians walk straight into the mouth of the lion, something must have quivered in their heart. What strange people are these, that they could face the lions, and we who are so rich and powerful would not dare. The laughter froze in their throat because they began to realize there was a new spirit alive in the world. A spirit so powerful that it eventually it would undermine and overcome them. So that a strange conversion began in the very people who were seeking to destroy the Christ. So that something overturned them. So that his church was built right in Rome. This is what is going to happen here. You see it already beginning to happen in South Africa. Many of us despair because that is one of the darkest situations on this planet. Yet the strange thing is, would you have imagined last year South African businessmen going to talk with the rebel leader? Something is happening in here. Something frightening is beginning to happen in here. There reaches a stage in every civilization where its lies are so grave that they become glaring. They're no longer easy to cover up. This is part of it. Whenever you see so many facts, begin to emerge suddenly when for years they have not been emerging. When you see we could stand in outer space and send down our eyes to the African art and find things that we didn't find before. When you see within the last 10 years all of these things we thought never existed in Africa which had already been dismissed suddenly coming out of the African art. We are aware that there is a different eye opening. There's a different spirit coming alive in the world. We are part of that spiritual movement, part of that revolutionary process, part of that change in consciousness, part of that crusade. Thank you very much. we